Hi, welcome. There is a lot, I mean a lot of information is being covered in this video. When I did a bit of a research, there are not many videos out there on the YouTube platform that explains all the accounting concept in one video. But I rather found more videos which explain each individual topic separately. The problem is, as a user who is new to the accounting world, will have to connect the missing dots. And a whole lot of time would be wasted trying to figure out what comes first, what comes next, and what is the order of events that happen in the accounting world. So to simplify things for you, I've created this video that will put everything in perspective without any gaps. And you're going to learn the entire accounting concepts in this video right from the beginning till the end without skipping any key concept. And for the ones who are new to the accounting world, someone who is trying to brush up the skills this video is going to be a gold mine and since i'm covering a lot of stuff it's going to be a bit lengthy but if you compare the time that you would put up in learning around the entire accounting process is minuscule compared to the time that you would be spending otherwise so i request watch till the end and you will get to know about that if you do not have time i request you watch whatever time you can and then either you can bookmark this video if you're watching it on your computer or, or put it in some place where you can go back and then refer to and continue from where you've left off. And yes, please do not forget to subscribe it and it would be a privilege for me to have you as one of my small subscriber base that I have. If you're looking out for a particular topic that you want to jump onto without having to go through all the concepts, then I would mention it in the description along with the timelines. You can go to the topic and click on the timeline and it will take you to that particular respective topic. And one good news for you is you can download this presentation that I'm using here. It's a 50 plus slide presentation and you're free to use it. And I will provide the links for you to download. Please watch till the end of this video. All right, let's get started. Let me first give you the entire overview of financial management and functional areas. And then we can drill down into the subject. If you look at the screen, the financial functions are primarily divided into two branches. One, corporate finance and two, accounting and control. The sub branch that we're going to deal with is financial accounting under accounting and control function, which I have highlighted in yellow here. If you're looking for a solid career in financial world, like becoming a chartered accountant or a chief financial officer, etc., then you should have a grip on all of these functions and under financial accounting we would be learning all of these and for us to get even to this point there are a lot of basics and important elements of accounting that need to be explained which i have covered in this video in detail i've structured this video in an easy to grasp manner with the help of mind maps the good thing is i'm going to keep this breakdown structure intact while i explain things so that you won't lose the context and it will be easier for your learning. So here is the mind map. I'm dividing basics of accounting video into three parts. The first part is understanding accounting. And then I will take you through the elements of accounting and the entire accounting process. Each part is further divided into subsections to make them logically fit together. So if you look at the screen, understanding accounting is divided into five sub parts. And then we have elements of accounting which is divided into three subparts, and then the accounting process is divided into six subparts. As I just explained, these subparts are further divided into smaller parts until all the process related activities are covered and explained. Now, if I expand all the pieces here, it does not fit the screen, but I will expand as we move along. Now let's get started with the first part of our topic, understanding accounting. If we need to understand accounting, we need to understand what is accounting, and why is accounting needed as a very first step. So what is accounting? Accounting is recording all financial transactions related to a business or a company or a firm. By the way, I just want to make it clear, in this video, I would be using the words business, organization, or a firm interchangeably. So do keep a note, when I use these words, is just for the sake of simplification as the context won't change despite me using these words interchangeably. So coming back to what is accounting. Accounting is a process of recording 
all financial transactions the keyword is recording all financial transactions and you may ask why do we need to even record all financial transactions and that comes up to the question why is accounting needed okay accounting is needed because it helps us to track all our incomes and expenses it helps us to understand whether the business is making profits or not and it also provides the management of the business or the investors of the business or any key stakeholder for that matter to take important decisions with respect to the firm's future so if you do not record them then there is no way for someone to know what is happening with the business so it is important to record the financial transactions and the other reason why we need to record the financial transactions is because it is by law required for every registered business to maintain the financial transactional records okay so that government can know how the business is doing whether the business is paying appropriate taxes or not so on and so forth now coming back to the point as i said accounting is a process of recording all financial transactions right we really need to understand what it means by a transaction we know in general what a transaction is transaction is nothing but you give something and you take something that's a transaction but there are few bits within the transactions that you need to understand which i'm going to talk about now so what is a transaction in the business language a transaction is an agreement between a buyer and a seller and this agreement is for exchange of goods or exchange of services in return for money or something valuable primarily it is about money when it comes to business so now let's say you sold your car to a person named john for two thousand dollars okay now what you've done is you exchange your car for two thousand dollars from your perspective right and from john's perspective he exchanged his money for your car so if you observe carefully there are two events happening when something is being exchanged and from our perspective the car went out and money came in but from john's perspective money went out and car came in so a transaction would have four events if you consider the different perspectives but in business we would always look things from our perspective this is a gap okay because sometimes we will not be able to understand whether something is a credit or something is a debit so when you look at from your perspective something is credited or something is debited but if you look at from other person's perspective the opposite would have happened okay so it is important to observe things from our perspective now i have to elaborate the question what is accounting accounting is nothing but recording all these exchanges that happen within the business as and when they happen the key point to remember is as and when they happen we need to record them okay and then we summarize all of these transactions or all of these exchanges that are happening in a business in statements over a period of time now why do we need to summarize these transactions just imagine the number of transactions that a multi billion dollar business can have if you take all these financial transactional records without summarizing them in their raw format and give it to the investors or the government authorities then they would have to spend their entire life trying to figure out which transaction is what and whether the company has made any profits or not and the sole reason why i need to summarize them into different financial statements or different financial records is just to make them easy to understand for others and there are certain standards that we need to follow while we summarize them but we also need to know how often do we need to summarize them or what is even mandated for what period we need to summarize them because we can summarize them for a month we can summarize them for a quarter or we can summarize them for half yearly or we can summarize them for a year this is where we get something called accounting period okay usually businesses would summarize these transactions quarter on quarter basis but it is always important and mandated that we need to record them over a period of year different countries would have different periods 
these are accounting periods they usually don't start on jan 1st and end on december 31st as we usually have our calendar period i have to tell you at a high level which countries follow which period if you take austria not australia it's austria their accounting period starts from jan 1st and it will end on december 31st and if you take india the accounting period starts from april 1st and it will end on march 31st and if you take australia the accounting period starts from 1st july to 30th june and in the us the accounting period starts from october 1st and it will end on september 30th now you might ask me a question why do we have different accounting periods we have different accounting periods because every country have different accounting standards that these companies have to report out as defined by the board okay board is nothing but a statutory body or a government body or a non profit organization that has been set up to come up with certain standards and certain financial accounting practices that the companies in their countries should adhere to so boards kind of create certain standards for their own countries they may say we need you to record all financial transactions we need you to produce this statement we need you to produce that statement we want you to report out your statements quarter on quarter or we may mandate you to report your statements half yearly and then annually quarterly is up to you these are certain kind of standards that each board will set up as per their convenience and as per the law or as per the policies that each country follows if you take an example the european countries follow a board called iasb which is international accounting standard boards but they have come up with the standard called ifrs okay boards will have a name the standards that they set would also have some name okay so in here european countries board is iasb which is international accounting standards for board and the standard they follow is ifrs which stands for international financial reporting standards likewise in the us we have a board called fasb which stands for financial accounting standards board and they follow the standard called us gap g a a p a gap stands for generally accepted accounting principles and similarly in india we have something called asp which stands for accounting standards board they follow the standards called ind as which stands for indian accounting standards do not get overwhelmed by the different boards or different standards for different regions and countries though they have different standards for reporting more or less all these boards would ask for similar financial statements some countries may ask for one or two more reports and some countries will ask for one or two less reports that's the only difference and we were talking about the financial statements for some time now now there are three primary financial statements that every country's board would ask the companies to prepare at the end of the accounting period they are profit and loss statement balance sheet cash flow statement there are other financial statement reports like change in shareholder equity but primarily these three are a must to be prepared in all the countries if you want to know what ifrs asks for and us gaps ask for and in as ask for separately i'm just putting an example here on the screen indian accounting standard board needs these following statements to be prepared by the companies one is the income statement which is also called as profit and loss account a balance sheet a statement of changes in equity a cash flow statement and an explanatory note informing the government what accounting policies have been followed by the company similarly if you look at the us gap they would request for three statements one is the income statement balance sheet cash flow statement now let us look what european country standards ask for which is ifrs they would ask for these five statements to be prepared at the end of their accounting period now if you look mostly they are asking for the profit and loss statement cash flow statement and a balance sheet and you really do not need to remember anything about these boards and the standards and the kind of reports they would ask for 
it is just a good to know information that i wanted to provide you so that you would get a holistic understanding that there are boards there are standards that each company needs to follow within their own countries okay now if you are new to the accounting world don't get bogged down by the terms like balance sheet income statement or a profit and loss account because we have not yet discussed about them as we move along i will explain each and everything and everything will make perfect sense at the end of this video and if possible revisit the video and watch it again if you have any doubts and you're gonna be like a super gem so please hang in there with me till we train our brains how to interpret and untangle all of the accounting subject part by part so for now we have understood what is accounting what is accounting needed what is a transaction what is an accounting period what is a board what is an accounting standard and what are some of the financial statements now let's look at the elements of accounting we are slowly getting into the meat of the subject in order for anyone to be able to generate the financial statements or have a complete grip of the accounting subject there are certain basic things that one should be aware of and as such it is imperative for us to know about the elements of accounting because once we are clear with these basic terms it would be easier to cover the accounting process there are three elements that we need to understand they are assets liabilities and capital let us start with assets we will understand what an asset is and i'll give you some of the examples and we will discuss about the different types of assets. So what is an asset? Assets are the items that your company owns that can provide future economic benefit. And at the opposite side of assets, we have liabilities. Assets put money in your pocket, liabilities take money out of your pocket. Let's look at the examples of assets. We have cash, we have cash equivalents, we have accounts receivables, we have inventory, we have power, plant and equipment now, these all things will fall under category of assets let's talk about them one by one cash cash is the most important asset of an organization it is important for an organization to have cash because it shows the liquidity position of a firm how much cash does the firm hold in hand because if you have cash it means that the firm is in a good position to pay out to its vendors to its employees and carry on with its operational activities without much issues so cash is considered as the most important asset for an organization and we have something called cash equivalents cash equivalents are called assets because they are short-term investments these investments can be into treasury bills government bonds securities etc these are called assets because they can be readily converted into cash whenever there is a need for cash it is cash but in other form okay now we have accounts receivables in short it is referred to as ar and also sometimes it is also known as trade receivables accounts receivable is nothing but the amount of money that we are to receive from the customers in future since we receive the money from our customers or our clients it is considered a form of cash because cash is an asset accounts receivable is also an asset so you might ask what if the customers or the clients do not pay us back for that very reason we have something called purchase order let's say you have company a and company b and company a is selling items to company b in that case company b would issue something called purchase order to company a now this purchase order is a legally binding document in the event if company b doesn't pay company a its money in its due course then company a has all the rights to sue company b so that is the reason a purchase order is taken from companies for any exchange of services and that is how they would recover the money okay so accounts receivable is an asset because we're gonna get money from other company in some point in time okay now we have also something called inventory what constitute as an inventory it is the raw materials goods that are semi-finished or fully finished and why are they considered asset 
because we can sell them and we can generate cash hence it is considered as an asset just that we're discussing about inventory let me also briefly touch upon what is a raw material semi-finished goods and fully finished goods so that we are clear with these terms as well raw materials is the basic components that a company uses to make its products and semi-finished is partially finished goods whereas fully finished is a fully ready product that can be sold into the market and then we have something called power plant and equipment it is denoted as p p and e so p p and e this is how it is referred to as and most of the organizations will have the properties like buildings factories land and etc and then machinery and the equipment okay these all things hold economic and monetary value because if we sell them in the market we get cash hence they are considered as assets the difference is that these are tangible assets which we can see feel and touch and these assets are vital to the operations of the business because if we do not have machinery or the plant or the equipment then there is no way that a company can go ahead and produce goods to sell in the market and these are all hefty investments okay because these are all hefty investments these hold economic and monetary value if there is a need you can very well sell them and generate cash hence they are considered as assets okay but there is one thing that you need to remember some of these assets will depreciate over a period of time like the machinery the building the equipment these all things will depreciate over a period of time i think the exception is the land which will appreciate over a period of time so we need to consider the depreciation value as well okay i will talk about them when we talk about depreciation so think of asset as anything that you can make cash if you sell them in the event you need capital for the business now that we've seen the examples of assets let's also categorize these assets and if i expand the asset types you will see here they're divided into two primary categories current assets and fixed assets the other name for current assets is short term assets and the other name for fixed assets is long term assets let's first see what is current assets current assets are those assets that can be easily liquidated when i say liquidated it means it can be converted into cash if needed for example let's say you have gold it can be liquidated in a day if needed likewise you have shares of a well known company they can be sold at a click of a button and can be converted into cash right so any asset that can be liquidated easily is termed as current assets and from the examples the short term assets are the cash the cash equivalents the accounts receivables and the inventory okay because they can be sold and can be converted into cash within a year's time in the accounting world if we say short term short term is within one year or within the accounting period and the long term means something that goes beyond a year two or more now one important point to make a note of is any expenses that you make up front like prepaid rents prepaid expenses are considered as assets can you tell why these expenses or the rents are considered as assets when they should be considered as liabilities the reason is because if we have not paid them up front they would have been counted as a cash in hand and for that very reason anything which is prepaid even the expense or the rents or anything is considered as a current asset because you also don't have to pay them going forward because you already have made the payment now let us see what fixed assets are this is simple to know the other name for fixed assets is long term assets fixed assets are those assets that can be used in the business operations that have a span of more than a year and examples of fixed assets are property plant and equipment often abbreviated as ppne apart from the current assets and fixed assets we have two more asset categories like tangible assets and intangible assets what is the meaning of tangible tangible is nothing but something that you can see feel touch and sense so from the above example if we carefully observe can cash be felt and touched yes right 
because it can be touched and felt it is a tangible asset similarly can you touch the inventory yes it can be felt and touched and this is also called as tangible asset now let's look at the intangible assets this is interesting there is a certain criteria for an asset to be considered as intangible okay the first criteria is it cannot be a current asset the second criteria is it cannot be a physical asset and the third important criteria is it should have future economic value when i say future economic value it means something that can generate money so if we take the example of let's say cash can it be an intangible asset so let's look at the criteria and understand whether it is an intangible asset or not so the first criteria is it cannot be current asset is cash a current asset yes very much so it is not an intangible asset and also cash is something that you can see and feel since it is both current asset and physical asset it cannot be considered as an intangible asset let's say accounts receivable can we consider this as an intangible asset let's look at the criteria again intangible asset says it cannot be a current asset whereas accounts receivable is a current asset so so it cannot be considered as an intangible asset so if we look at the examples of intangible assets we have brand value we have goodwill we have trademarks we have patents we have intellectual properties we have copyrights and we have logos brand value why is it called as an intangible asset to understand can you feel and touch the brand value does it have a physical presence the answer is no you cannot feel and you cannot touch it so you may get the question why is even brand value considered as an asset it's just a name it's just the brand name how can it be an asset to give you an example when i google the brand value of coca cola name as per 2020 valuation it is valued at 84 billion dollars meaning if coca cola is ready to sell just its name nothing else not the property not the company but just the name there are investors there are people who are ready to purchase the name at 84 billion dollars because these investors know if they can produce some cola drink and stick its name there it will sell because of the brand value hence brand value is an important asset though it may not exist in physical form though it is not a current asset but it is a very important asset intangible assets are very important a side note for you if you really think about the brand brand is nothing but a perception in people's mind that was built over a period of time you cannot see it but it plays an important role so piece of advice from me build your brand as an individual your actions your commitment your ability to stick to your commitments and ability to show results will create a perception in people's mind and this can happen only if you're consistent over a period of years and this is how you build your brand all right let's go back to the topic so let's see what are the other intangible assets so brand is one likewise goodwill trademarks patents intellectual properties copyrights and logos these all are examples of intangible assets so that brings us to the end of assets category so we have discussed about current assets fixed assets tangible assets and intangible assets now let's move on to liabilities liabilities are something that you owe to other parties meaning something that you're obliged to pay to other parties as i said before assets put money in your pocket liabilities will take out money from your pocket examples of liabilities are accounts payable also referred to as ap and we have interest and we have taxes as liabilities let us discuss one by one so what is accounts payable accounts payable is the amount we owe to other parties for the things that we bought from them or for the services we receive from them okay other parties can include suppliers or anybody accounts payable is a liability because we have an obligation to pay them back and since we're paying them back it takes out the money from the business okay and we have interest interest is another liability we have to pay money for the loans that we have taken for the mortgages that we have taken on properties 
so on and so forth. Since we are paying out money in the form of interest, interest is called a liability. And then we have taxes like income tax, value add tax, sales tax, property tax. These are all also considered as liabilities because we make payments in the form of tax. Like we have current assets and long term assets, we do have current liabilities and long term liabilities. Okay, the word current in the business world means within a fiscal year, right? So when we say current liabilities, it means that we are obliged to pay within the current fiscal year. Let's look at the examples of current liabilities. We have accounts payable, we have accrued liabilities, we have debt that needs to be paid within a year, and we have taxes that needs to be paid within a year. These are all current liabilities. We have discussed about accounts payable and we have discussed about taxes and we have discussed about interest. But we have not discussed about accrued liabilities. Let me clear what it means. Accrued as a word means accumulation over time. Accrued liabilities mean the payments that have been accumulated over a period of time which were not paid and are to be paid within this current year. So, since you're making those payments which you were supposed to pay in this current year, it is called current liability. Okay, so let's look at the long term liabilities. To put it simple, anything that needs to be paid not in this current year is a long term liability. It could be the interest payments on loans, mortgages cars or the loans that have been taken for machinery, equipment, land, anything that is being paid in the next fiscal year or something that has been spread across multiple fiscal years is called a long-term liability. And like we have tangible assets and intangible assets in assets category. Under liability section, we do not have tangible liabilities or intangible liabilities. What we have is something called contingent liabilities. But the important point to remember is contingent liabilities can be a part of current liability or a long term liability depending upon the situation. But most likely contingent liabilities are a long term liability. Let me explain what a contingent liability is for. The money that is kept aside for unforeseen future events are called contingent liabilities. Some of the examples if I have to quote are lawsuits. Companies need to keep some money aside for any unforeseen lawsuits that they may get into. And the money that is kept aside for such events are called contingent liabilities. Other examples are product warranties. When companies sell products, they need to provide warranty services for the products they sell. And the money that is kept aside for such warranty issues are called contingent liabilities. Likewise, we also have some of the companies that offer benefits such as post-retirement pensions. Those are again the liabilities which fall under contingent liabilities. Okay. Do you remember Galaxy Note 7 recall? It costed about $5.6 billion for that recall. And I call the recall from hell, okay, because it's a whooping $5.6 billion for a phone recall, right? Companies can go out of business if things go haywire because Samsung is a big company. It was able to afford that recall. And there are many companies which have gone bankrupt because of product recalls. Anyway, you get the idea. The money set aside for such purposes are called contingent liabilities. Now let's look at the other crucial elements of accounting which is capital. Capital is further divided into three sections equity, income and expense. Income is also called as revenue, expense is also called as cost. And let's start with equity. Let me explain this with an example. To start a business we need capital right? Capital in simple terms means money. A person who invests in a business will become a shareholder and owns a part of that company. Equity is nothing but the money that has been invested by a shareholder. Okay, And there could be many shareholders for a company. 
capital can be invested in the company at any point in time. For example, people invest capital at the initial startup phase of the company, but also shareholders can invest money during any period of the business operations and also when the company gets listed in the stock market and issues its shares the first time when a company issues a share after getting listed on a stock exchange is called ipo initial public offering and also company can get capital when it is being publicly traded on open market after the ipo so company can get money in many different forms. So always remember this. Equity is the amount of capital invested by a shareholder. In business accounting, in financial accounting, this equity plays a big role. So please do remember this. It is very important. Okay. Now I'm going to put up an important question. In the assets section, we discussed cash is considered as an asset and right now what we're saying is when a shareholder invests money in the company it is called as an equity why do we not call it as an asset not to worry if you're not sure i will explain it and it becomes very clear you will get the distinction between equity and assets this is why it is really important to understand the concepts there are two words here right one is equity one is assets equity is just a book value of the shareholders capital meaning it is recorded in the books stating that x amount of money is invested by so and so shareholder so that the company can keep track of the shareholders capital since companies have to keep track of the shareholders capital it is recorded as an equity okay whereas the money which a company has received from the shareholder is considered as an asset because that is something a shareholder has given to the company for the company to use it because company owns this money it calls it as an asset from the company's perspective it is an asset from the shareholders perspective it is an equity okay so if anybody is investing money in a company in the form of capital and an entry is written into the book saying that an equity of x amount for so and so shareholder and the cash is recorded in the books as an asset i will explain how the entries are done and it will be clear when i talk about the double entry system under accounting process in the video itself so stay tuned okay this is very important i just want to clear the distinctions so now let us get a bit more into the details and understand the relationship between the assets the liabilities and equity let me explain that relationship okay you will get to know the formula how these three things are linked together with a very good example okay let us say a person is starting a company called abc okay and if that person has invested some capital in the business we call this person a shareholder as we know at the very start of the business no one has invested anything we just starting up the business we need capital some person has come up giving some money to the company and that is all the money that the company has so at that point in time the asset of the company is the cash and it is equal to the equity of the shareholder so now the equation should look something like asset is equal to equity whatever has been invested by the owner is the only asset that a company has right now let us say after some time after a year when the company starts running the business it may take some loan from a bank when a loan is taken from a bank this loan is called a liability because the company is obliged to pay the money that it has taken from the bank but the cash that we receive from the loan what is it called it is called an asset so now the loan becomes a liability and the cash becomes an asset if you observe carefully so we have cash from the shareholder before now we have cash from the loan now our assets of the company have gone up because we have more cash that was given to us by the shareholder and that was given to us by a bank at the same time we also have added a liability 
the liability has gone up. Before the equation was when the company got started, asset was equal to the equity. Now, after taking a bank loan, total asset that we have is equal to the equity that we receive from the shareholder and the cash that we receive from the bank. So, we have an equation now. Asset is equal to the equity plus liability. Just get this concept right, okay? Now, imagine if the company has returned the money to the bank. In that case, our liability has gone down. So is the asset as well because how are we paying the money to the bank? We're taking the cash that was with the company and paying it to the bank. So the asset has reduced but also at the same time the liability has reduced. And still the equation will remain intact because assets is equal to equity plus liability. Let's assume there is no liability at all for the company and we would consider liability as zero. Okay. Even if you take the same equation, asset is equal to equity plus liability. If there are no liabilities for the company, we put zero in the place of liability. That becomes asset is equal to equity. The moment we have some sort of liabilities coming in, our asset will grow up and liabilities get added to the equity. Just get this concept right. Okay. When you take a loan, cash is coming in. It is increasing the asset value. And also at the same time, it is also increasing the liability. Okay. You may also think why is equity not being considered as a liability? Why is it being specifically mentioned as equity and not a liability? Because at the end of the day, we have received money from a shareholder, right? Yes. The distinction is, this is what you need to understand. The reason is, even if the company is making losses, company is liable or have an obligation to pay back the loan but there is no such obligation to return the money to the shareholder so if company makes profits shareholder will get more money but if company makes losses shareholder will lose money shareholders will only be benefited if the company makes profit okay if there are more shareholders the profit is distributed according to the equity that they hold in the company in the form of dividends. Dividends are nothing but the portion of money that is set aside from the profits to distribute among its shareholders as a gesture for the capital they have invested. Equity comes with a risk. Okay, and The shareholder is ready to take the risk. But whereas when you take loans or when you borrow money, you have an obligation to pay back. So they are less risky than equity. Okay. Let's suppose a company is being sold due to its non-performance. The first thing that gets cleared is the liabilities. After that, if there is anything left, then it will be distributed to the shareholders according to the equity they hold. Let's assume if the company was left with nothing after it has been sold, then the equity has become zero. Okay, so that is the reason we give a separate name for equity and we give a separate name for liability. We now have come to a logical conclusion how we have gotten this formula asset is equal to equity plus liability, right? Now you can use the same formula and then you can also calculate the equity. Now if I take liabilities from here and send it to there, then the equity is equal to asset minus liability. Okay. This is a universal formula for any business. Never ever forget this equation. Yes, I mean it. It is such an important equation that the whole world's businesses run on it. Okay. So the more the asset and less the liabilities, it is good for the shareholder. Okay. Now let's understand various types of equities. We have something called paid in capital, retained earnings and net profit. Let's start with paid in capital. It is nothing but the firm's starting capital. For example, if a company is getting started, if shareholder A comes in and invests the money, it is called paid in capital. Okay. And what are retained earnings? 
these are the dividends that were not distributed to the shareholders in the past years let's assume a company is making profits and it is making profit year on year it is upon the company's discretion whether to distribute the profits that they make in a year in the form of dividends to the shareholders okay dividends is nothing but a portion of the profit that gets distributed among the shareholders now if the company hasn't distributed any profits in the previous years to the shareholders then that money is considered as retained earnings you may think why the company did not pay it to its shareholders first of all it is at the discretion of the company whether to give out dividends or not and secondly it could be because company may think that they need the profits that they have earned to reinvest back into the company on behalf of shareholders and it will further help the company to grow okay so that is the reason sometimes companies do not pay out dividends even if they are making profits you may ask what about the earnings they make this year it is called net profit it is sometimes also referred as net income net profit is the profit that is made in the current year okay and net profit is considered as an equity and equity belongs to whom to the shareholders if a company is making profits if company is earning more money then that money and the profits belongs to the shareholders but whether to release the money to the shareholders or not is something that is in company's discretion no shareholder can go and command that you have to release the dividends it is in the company's best interest companies would work but you may ask you know how come then the shareholder gets benefited the shareholder gets benefited because the amount of share that he holds in the company is now gone up because the profits were not released in the form of dividends the profit is getting accumulated as an equity now the equity portion is getting bigger and we have the same number of shareholders the shareholder will get a bigger portion than what he or she has invested in the company that is the benefit for the shareholder because he or she knows at the end of the day that even though not receive dividends the share value of the company has gone up and as such they should be happy with that now let us understand incomes and expenses and their types let's start with income the other name for income is revenue there are two types of incomes or revenues that a firm can generate like the revenue from day to day sales from its core business activities or the revenue they can generate from the activities outside of their core operations now let me give an example let's say we have a mobile manufacturing company okay now if the company is generating revenue from the sales of mobile phones then it is called revenue from its core business activities the same company can have many more assets many more buildings right or may have deposited some cash in the banks right now they may get revenue in the form of interest from the bank or if they have leased out lands or money in the form of rents now these are the revenue that a company is receiving not from its core business activities right so there are two types of revenues that a company generates one is from its core business activities and from the activities which are outside of the core operations all right so the income received from the sale of core operations is called revenue and at the same time the income received from non core activities is called other revenue we need to show this bifurcation of incomes in the financial reports how much revenue was received from the core operational activities and how much revenue was generated from other activities some may think revenue is a revenue whether it is a direct revenue or an indirect revenue at the end of the day it is all the cash that the company is getting i'll tell you the reason why it is important let's say if you are a shareholder trying to invest in a company okay so it is important for you to understand how much income the company is getting from its core business operations as it will give you a clear indication how the company is performing in its sector 
okay because at the end of the day you are investing in a company based on its performance in its sector now if it is not getting money from its core operations and getting money from other activities then it is not good for the company well it may be good from a revenue standpoint but the revenue from its core operations should be higher than the revenue from the other activities now let us look at expenses expenses are also referred to as costs expenses is the cost incurred for something that you need to pay and there are several different types of expenses for a business please do pay attention here because it's really important to understand the different expense types for us to be able to compute profits now, if you do not understand the different expense types you will not be able to compute the profits i'll explain how let's start with the cogs cost of goods sold so this is called a direct cost for selling the goods and these costs are essential for example let's say a business owner is selling a bread to sell the bread the cost that gets incur let's say our raw material the processing cost for the raw material in the plant packaging cost transportation of breads to retail shops these all costs are essential because they cannot be avoided now if these costs are not done they cannot produce bread and they cannot sell hence these costs are essential and these costs that are directly linked to the production of goods is called costs of goods sold okay once again i repeat cogs involves all the costs related to the production and distribution of the goods for example the raw materials the processing cost the electricity cost the packaging cost the transportation cost the laborers who work in the plant okay the laborers who work in the plant the wages of those laborers these are all directly linked to the production of a product and these are all direct costs now let us understand what is an operating cost operating costs are nothing but administrative cost these costs are also called as sgna sgna means selling general and administrative cost that gets incurred not due to the direct sale of goods but for reasons like advertisements it people accounting salaries of office personnel these are often white collar jobs like management salaries office rents office electricity utility bills etc anything that is not directly related to the cogs are called as operating cost now these are necessary costs but not as essential as needed to produce the products a key point to remember is to understand whether it is a cogs or whether it is an operating cost is if there is an expense if you do not do that expense will it hamper the production of the product will it hamper the production of products reaching to your customers if yes then it is a direct cost but you may argue that you know there is a management cost which is involved we need management we need administrative cost we need it so on and so forth this also should be a direct cost then if you do not have it if you do not have accounting people if you do not have an office if you do not have white collar people a person simply can go can buy the raw material can buy and do the processing can sell the goods can do the transport and can sell the goods directly to the retailers right so even if there is no white collar person they can produce the goods and they can sell it in the market however think if there is no blue collar person if there is no raw material if there is no plant can we sell goods can the white collar jobs exist no these are all indirect costs for the company okay they are called as operating costs okay so that is the distinction between cogs which is a direct cost and operating cost which is an indirect cost all right now let us look at what is a depreciation depreciation means reduction in value of a physical asset let's say you have a car the value of the car depreciates over a period of time right so it means the value of car depreciates likewise we have machinery we have equipment right these also depreciate with time so the company has to show 
this as an expense in the form of depreciation okay and then we have something called amortization you know what is amortization amortization means same thing as depreciation however the difference is depreciation deals with the physical assets whereas amortization deals with intangible assets like you have patents rights copyrights licenses so on and so forth these all come with some sort of a validity over a period of time okay so these intangible assets hold value as an asset as long as they are valid but when the patents gets expired they hold no value because there is no one who's going to come and you know buy the patents to produce the product as long as the company has a patent no one else can produce that product and for that reason patent holds value but when the patent gets expired now anyone and everyone can go and make those products so amortization deals with the things which are intangible in nature they deal with intangible assets now we have something called interest paid interest paid is the amount of interest that a company pays for the loan now this is a form of expense generally firms have some sort of loans right uh, they take for running their business operations and they pay interest on these loans to banks or wherever they've taken the loan from and every year the firm is obliged to pay the interest rate and paying interest rate has to be recorded as a cost under interest paid expenses and we have taxes this is something no one can avoid right a firm pays taxes such as VAT, which is value added tax, sale tax, etc., and the tax on the income as well, if profits are made. Now, these are all considered as expenses. Now that we have understood the different types of expenses, I'm going to explain how to derive the net profit from the incomes and expenses, or let us call it as revenues and costs. This is going to be a bit interesting, okay, and it will all make sense because we already have looked into the different types of revenues and expenses it's going to be super easy for you to understand this now so let's start with the revenue of the firm okay the direct revenue of the firm okay now if you remove the direct cost from the direct revenue of the firm you get a gross profit okay now from the gross profit if you remove the indirect expenses such as operating costs you get something called EBITDA it is spelled as E B I T D A E B I T D A right pronounced as EBITDA now if the firm has any other income then they need to add other income here and they also need to remove the expenses related to that other income and if the firm has no other income then they don't need to add it here okay so this is the formula so gross profit minus operating expenses plus other income minus other expenses okay you get EBITDA now EBITDA means earnings before interest taxes depreciation and amortization all right it is earnings before interest okay not income tax it is earnings before interest and taxes and depreciation and amortization okay now from EBITDA if you remove the depreciation expenses and amortization expenses you get something called EBIT EBIT which is earnings before interest and taxes now if we remove the interest and taxes from EBIT we get something called net income net income is also called as profit after tax if the net income is positive then this profit becomes a part of the shareholders equity please note all these terms gross profit EBITDA EBIT net income all these are especially important and corporates and investors do focus on each of these items now that you know what are the two types of revenue we have which is direct revenue and indirect revenue and the types of expenses which are cogs operating costs depreciation amortization interest taxes now that you know all these isn't it easy for you to compute the net income i know it is easier said than done 
However, we at least know the process. So let us do a quick recap. Okay. What we've learned in elements of accounting is what is an asset and the types of assets. We learned what is a liability and the types of liabilities. We also learned what is an equity and the types of equities and the relationship between an asset and equity and the liability. Okay. And then we looked into the types of revenues. We classified revenues into two types. And then we also looked into the types of expenses. We classified these expenses as COGS, operating costs, depreciation, amortization, interest, and taxes. And then we derived net income from the incomes and taxes. All right. And please note there are three sections here understanding accounting, elements of accounting, and accounting process. Under understanding accounting, we learn what is accounting and why is it important. We then learn what is a transaction. We then learn what are the different accounting periods. We also looked into some of the board names and the standards. And now we have looked into the elements of accounting. There is a strong reason I'm recapping this again. It is just to make it easy and not to let you lose focus from the context of things that you've learned. Okay. Now that these two parts are completed, we're going to look into the crucial part of this training video, which is accounting process. In here, you will learn all the concepts of accounting and one more thing by the way if you've liked the content so far please give me a thumbs up and if you haven't subscribed yet please can you do so because i have very few subscribers and it would be a privilege to have you on my subscribers list let's get started with the accounting process now if i have to tell you the accounting process can be summed up into five simple steps in the following order step one identify transactions step two do a journal entry step three prepare a ledger account step four prepare a trial balance in step five you have to prepare the financial statements like profit and loss account balance sheet statement of cash flow okay you may see trading account listed here the reason i have not mentioned is because not all companies prepare trading account but i have included it here because i want to explain it and we can go through it okay Let's dig deeper to understand these concepts. The very first step in accounting starts with identifying a transaction with a proof. Okay. Let's say you sell something or buy something, right? You need some sort of a proof for that, like an invoice for the things that you bought or a bill or a voucher for the items that you've sold. The proof is also called as a source document. And this becomes a starting point for our accounting process. The second step that follows after identifying transactions is recording these transactions. Where do you record these transactions? You record these transactions in a book called journal. And the act of recording the transactions in the journal is called journal entry. Now you may ask a question, what is journal and why it should be recorded only in journal? Well, journal means a diary in simple terms. In past days, People used to record everything in their diaries. In other words, they used to call this diary as a journal. From the practice, it arrived that we need to record every business financial transactions in a business diary called journal, hence the name journal. But unlike we write the way we want in our personal diaries, there is a standard that we need to follow to record the business financial transactions. And it is called journal entry standards now let's look at the rules that we need to follow to record these journal entries there is something called double entry system okay if you remember we said every transaction has two events so both events of a transaction need to be recorded in the journal one event of the transaction would be a credit and the other event of the transaction would be a debit okay I repeat, one event of the transaction would be entered as a credit and the other event of the transaction would be entered as a debit. Credit entry is done on the right side of the journal. And the debit entry is done on the left side. Okay, so the amount for the credit and debit should always match. Let's say we sold a product for $200. From the company's standpoint, the product worth is $200. And we have received 200 from the other party. So the entry for the credit and the debit should have $200. Okay, they should match with each other. Now, which entry goes where? I will explain that. Okay, 
but we need to remember to keep things in balance the amount for credit and the amount for debit should always match transactions in themselves are various in nature a transaction could be for buying something from a vendor a transaction could be for selling something to a customer a transaction could be taking a loan so these are different types of transactions that happen in a business world in the business world categorization is based on the type of the transactions in the event is called an account okay so there are two events now based on the event type we have to categorize them under these three types that we have on the screen personal real and nominal these are called accounts okay personal account real account and nominal account so why are they are being called accounts because depending upon the type of transaction event they may go into either personal or they may go into real or they may go into nominal now we need to understand what transaction events come under personal what transaction events come under real and what transaction events come under nominal okay so let us discuss the different types of accounts so let's start with personal account any transaction event related to a person or a company or an entity comes under personal account okay if you take an example let's say you've done a transaction with john the transaction would have two events for you transaction events that are related to john would come under personal account and similarly companies would get into transactions with another company right so those transactions will also come under personal accounts any transaction that you do with a bank they will also come under personal account because bank is an entity okay and for transaction events related to assets and liabilities will fall under real accounts category it could be your tangible assets or it could be your intangible assets okay it could be any liabilities so any transaction event that is related to an asset or a liability would fall under real accounts so now let's look at nominal accounts transaction events related to income expenses any investments that the firm made profits short term gains all are recorded under nominal accounts okay so now let me give you an example and then let me show you how the transaction events fall into different accounts okay now let's say you bought a car for $10000 cash so here we have two events you bought a car you paid in cash you bought a car right what is a car car is an asset right we've seen here transaction events related to assets come under real accounts right so the second event is you paid in cash what is a cash cash is an asset right and the transaction event related to asset falls under real account again so in this transaction both the events belong to real account category okay so it is not necessary that all the times that both the event should fall under one category type sometimes a transaction which has two events one of the events can get into real account one of the events can get into nominal account it depends so you now know that you can break the transaction into two events and one of the events as per the rule will get into one of the accounts right but you also need to understand which of this transaction event is a credit and which of this transaction event is a debit there is a rule actually okay so this is a simple rule if you remember this rule it will help you understand which event is a credit which event is a debit okay i'm going to explain these rules now okay for the transactions related to a personal account you need to debit the receiver and credit the giver okay let's say john is giving $2000 to our company abc okay john who is he is he the giver or the receiver so remember we need to look at the transactions from our perspective let's say we are the company abc john is giving $2000 to company abc now who is the giver john is the giver who is the receiver we are the receiver so the transaction event we will debit on company abc and we will credit john because he is the giver okay and for the transaction events related to real accounts you need to debit what comes in and credit what goes out okay 
a repeat for the transaction events related to real account you need to debit what comes in and credit what goes out let's take the car example again okay let's say you bought a car for ten thousand dollars okay you bought a car which is an asset now this comes under real account correct and you gave the cash which is an asset again and this comes under real account now as per the rule what does it say for real accounts debit what comes in what is coming in the car is coming in right car is an asset so we would debit what is coming in car is coming in so write in car account debited okay for ten thousand what is going out cash cash is again an asset so we would write cash account credited ten thousand dollars okay this is how you need to write okay so debit entry is done usually on the left side credit entry is done usually on the right side so it should look something like this car account debtor ten thousand dollars cash account creditor ten thousand dollars debtor is nothing but a debit entry creditor is nothing but a credit entry okay dr they call it debtor cr they call it creditor okay i will give you one more example bear with me this is just to help you clear the concept okay let's say you paid the daily wage of 240 dollars cash now this transaction has two events again you paid the wage what is a wage wage is a direct expense right and direct expense comes under nominal accounts and let's look at the second account how much did you pay you paid 240 dollars cash right so what is a cash cash is an asset and comes under real account okay cash is going out so we can call this labor as a wage account or we can just mention the labor okay so you can write it as labor account data 240 dollars and cash account cr 240 dollars right the double entry should look like this some people may even get a doubt i told there are three types of accounts personal real and nominal but i'm writing here something like cash account or labor account and so on instead of writing the nominal account and real account i'll explain the difference these three accounts i mentioned are the categories let's say you have written abc bank now this is an account that falls under personal account because it is an entity all the accounts related to entity will fall under personal account okay hope you're now getting the gist of how the double entry system works as i mentioned the idea is to get you the concepts right okay but what i observed is on different forums people have a difficulty on you know remembering these rules for these three account types like personal account real account and the nominal account so how do you remember this so for that i'm going to give you a tip how to remember these rules okay i will just give you a mnemonic with which you can remember these rules so remember these three statements and you will never forget the rules for these three accounts okay first statement for personal account personal doctor is a cool gentleman in this statement personal stands for personal account d in dr stands for debit r in dr stands for receiver okay and the C in the word cool stands for credit. G in the word gentleman stands for giver. If you remember this word, personal doctor is a cool gentleman, then it is easier to remember that particular rule. Coming to the real accounts, remember this. Real don comes in, criminal goes out. Real is the name for real account. D in the don is for debit. Comes in is what comes in. Okay. So debit comes in and then we have criminal goes out c stands for credit here okay in the criminal c stands for credit goes out is what goes out so in real accounts debit what comes in credit what goes out and we have third one which is nominal account so for that normally dashing entrepreneurs like cars iphones and gadgets if you could remember normally dashing entrepreneurs like cars iphone and gadgets so normally would stand for nominal account d stands for debit e stands for expenses l stands for liabilities okay debit expenses and liabilities and then c in the cars stands for credit and i in the iphone stands for income g in the gadget stands for gains so for nominal accounts debit expenses and losses credit incomes and gains okay 
and also coming back to the point this is important for you to remember okay you might have some notion that credit is a bad and debit is good or vice versa so just to clear this air in accounting world the words debit and credit have no confirmed meaning they do not have any negative or positive notions attached to them it all depends on the transaction event type and the account category under which they fall okay in some places credit is good in some places debit is good so we cannot really justify or have an opinion on them okay uh, just remember that okay you just have to enter the debit and credit as per the rules that's it so later i'm going to make an in-depth video on each of these topics and one of them would be recording general entries as well in which i will dig a lot deeper again to make you guys master of the subject so please do look out for such videos one thing to remember if the quality of your general entries is good then the output of your financial records will be good otherwise things will mismatch so doing an accurate general entry is key to avoid problems going ahead okay so if you look at the screen this is what the rules of the journal entry is to record a transaction every transaction must have a debit entry and a credit entry the amount of debit should be equal to the amount of credit bifurcate the transaction type and see which transaction event will fall under which account type and analyze which transaction event to be credited and which one to be debited based on the debit and credit entry rules we just discussed okay so now let us look at the ledger account let's first understand what it means by a ledger ledger in actual sense means a collection of books in the business accounting it means collection of journals why is it called a ledger account because it takes out all the entries that are there in journal or many journal books and these entries get posted into various accounts in the ledger account okay hence they are called ledger accounts you may have heard the word called ledger posting ledger posting is nothing but the process of transferring the process of picking up each entry in the journal book and recording it in the ledger we do it at the end of accounting period we don't usually do it in the beginning okay and why do we do it i'm going to explain it by the way do you know ledger is called king of all books in accounting world so how do we do it a business may have multiple journal entry books right and as you know in the journal entries we record all the debit entries and credit entries throughout correct now it is a mix of all different entries related to different accounts now we take all the debit entries from all the journals related to one particular account and list them on one side of the page similarly we take all the credit entries from all the journals related to the same account and place it onto the other side as per the standard procedure all debits go on the left side and all credit entries go on the right side of the ledger okay so let's say we have an account called abc company account okay now we look out for the debit entries for this abc company in all the journal books and write all the debit entries on the left side and we also look out for all the credit entries for abc company in the journal books and we write them on the right side of the book and once we are done with this account we move on to another account let's say on the screen we see cash account ledger now we search for cash account entries in all the journal books and we list out all the debit entries and we place it on the left side and then we list out all the credit entries and then we place them onto the right side we repeat this process until all the accounts that are listed in the journal entries are completed okay until we finish all the account types that we have used in our journal books okay so once we write the debit entries and credit entries for all the accounts we sum the totals of debits and we sum the totals of credit for each account type let's say we have cash account ledger now right we have listed all the debits and credits for cash account we sum up all the debits for cash account and we get a total debit value for a cash account similarly we sum up all the credit values for cash account and we get a total of the credit value for the cash account okay 
Sometimes you may have a higher value for debit. Sometimes you may have a higher value for credit, depending upon the nature of transactions we had. Then what we do is we take the difference between the credits and the debits. The difference amount is called closing balance of a ledger. Okay, closing balance of a ledger for the year end accounting. So let me explain what a closing balance of a ledger means. See on the screen. Okay, let's take the example of the cash account ledger. We list all the debit entries of the cash account on the left side and the credit entries of the cash account on the right side. And if we sum the debit entries, we get a value of 26,800. If we sum up all the credit entries, we get a total of 2,900. Now we have a debit side, which is of a greater value than the credit side. If we calculate the difference, the debit side balance comes up as $23,900. This is called the closing balance of the cash account ledger for the year end. For some accounts, the closing balance will be on the debit side and for some accounts on the credit side. But you know what? If you sum all the closing balances of all the accounts, the sums would exactly match with each other. Can you tell why? I repeat, if you take all the closing balances of all the accounts, okay, you sum their debits and you sum their credits, you get the exact number. Can you tell why? It is because when we made the entries, we made two events for each transaction, right? So the general entry rule says the general entry should have two entries, one for debit and one for credit. And the amount of credit should match to the amount of debit. So if you sum the debits closing balance and the credits closing balance, they would also match here. Okay, that is the reason. You know what a ledger entry is also called as a T-shaped account. Ledger account is also called as a T-shaped account. Let me show it, okay? Because when you write all the debit entries on the left and credit entries on the right, it takes the shape of the T, okay? As you see on the screen, as such, it is also informally known as T-shaped accounts or T accounts. Okay, so one thing you need to remember, okay, nowadays no one is doing a journal entry posting manually because we have software systems in place. A software system would automatically create the ledger accounts with just a click of a button. But as a professional, as a learner, we need to know what is happening in the backend. Once you know the concepts, you will know what the system is doing. So I will also be making an in-depth video again on ledger account, how to do a ledger posting and the pro forma and etc so on and so forth so do watch out for these videos okay i hope you got the idea of what a ledger account is now let's look at trial balance in simple terms trial balance is an accounting report that is it it's just an accounting report and why is it pulled it is pulled because to make sure that the totals of debit and the totals of credit match each other okay it is in the name itself trial balance it is basically an internal report that is taken by the accountants to ensure the debits match with the credits and there are no errors made while recording journal entry transactions and this is also kind of an audit report just to make sure that there are no errors that happen while posting the journal entries into the ledger accounts okay so how do they check it you may ask it's simple what they do is they take all the debit closing balances from all the ledger accounts and they also take all the credit closing balances from all the ledger accounts and they sum up and check if the total of debits from the ledger accounts is exactly matching with the total of credits. And why do they need to check it? They do this audit because they want to validate the information first before proceeding to generate the financial statements. Remember, if there is an error that is made while doing journal entry recording or while doing journal entry posting, financial statements may not be accurate but as per the law companies are required to produce accurate financial statements this is a kind of an audit that they do by doing a trial balance and let us see how it is done okay we have assets category account and these are cash accounts these are receivables and land and so on and so forth so when we prepare a ledger account for cash account receivable and land we got the closing balances as these on the debit side similarly for the liabilities based accounts like accounts payable notes payable 
we got these closing balances on the credit side now we total the debits and credits and ensure they match exactly this is how they check let's recap what we've learned so far we've learned about identifying a transaction we've learned about how to record transactions in journals we've learned about creating a ledger account we also learned about what a trial balance is and how do they do the trial balance now let's look at the trading account okay not all companies prepare the trading account the trading account is prepared by manufacturing and trading companies only to be specific the companies that engage in the sales and purchase of goods prepare trading accounts and as such trading account is related to manufacturing transactions only service provider firms do not prepare this trading account for example a company that manufacture cars they prepare the trading account and if you have a company that provides software services they do not prepare the trading account okay the transactions related to manufacturing are captured in an account called trading account let's get deeper into the trading account okay so you may ask why is trading account important why only for manufacturing related firms trading accounts is an important statement from cost point of view okay with the help of trading account firms can get to know which particular product is earning profits and which one is making losses trading accounts help the firms to maximize the profits and cut losses right management of the firms are particularly interested in the trading accounts and also it helps the sales tax authorities to know the purchases and the sales that are done by a company and accordingly they would levy sales tax for the sales that the company is showing in their tax returns so what does a trading account contains a trading account takes into consideration the raw materials the semi furnished goods the fully finished goods as an opening stock for the accounting period semi furnished goods are nothing but partly finished goods for example a product preparation can go through many stages of processing let's say a product goes through five processing stages to become a fully finished product if the product has gone through processing partly and not completely through all its stages then it is called as semi furnished goods and we have fully finished goods which are nothing but the goods that are ready to be sold in the market and we have raw materials raw material is nothing but the material that is purchased to make the product which has not yet gone through the processing okay so in progress goods is nothing but the work in progress goods that is currently going through the process in the manufacturing plant okay so opening stock or the opening inventory means the same thing for those who are not aware opening stock is nothing but the amount or the value of materials a firm has or was available to use at the beginning of the accounting period opening stock is equal to cost of goods sold plus ending inventory minus purchases okay this is a simple formula that can be used to calculate the opening stock so a trading account takes into consideration opening stock for the accounting period now, as i just said we are taking into account the opening stock right but what about the closing stock yes we also need to take into consideration the closing stock but what is the difference between the opening stock and the closing stock as i just mentioned the opening stock is the amount of material or the value of the materials a firm has or was available at the beginning of the accounting period right similarly the closing stock is the amount of unsold stock lying in your business at the end of accounting period in simple terms it's the inventory which is still in your business waiting to be sold at the end of accounting period the stock which was not sold is valued and they come up with the number that number is called closing stock and the closing stock can be in various forms such as raw materials semi finished goods and in the in process goods okay so i repeat again closing stock is whatever the stock that is unsold at the end of the accounting period so if you observe carefully the closing stock of the previous accounting periods would automatically become the opening stock of the current accounting period okay I'll explain it with an example. Let's take a car manufacturing company from India. They manufacture cars throughout the year, right? So they do the sales throughout the year. We learn that the accounting period for India starts on April 1st 
and ends on March 31st. And on March 31st, end of the day, whatever the stock that was unsold, including the finished cars, including the semi-finished cars, the raw materials, the car company will calculate the amount of the unsold items and it will show them as closing stock for the financial records. Once they show this closing stock in the financial records, do they throw out this closing stock items because they were unsold in the period? No, right? Because it is money, okay? At the end of the day, it is money. No one can throw money just like that. They just use it for the next accounting period. And when they start the next accounting period from April 1st, they would mention in the books that this is our opening stock for the year. So basically, the closing stock of the previous accounting period becomes the opening stock of the current accounting period. Now, one question should come to mind. How do companies get to know the value or the amount for the closing stock? The closing stock or the opening stock is valued at cost price or realizable value, whatever is less, whichever is less. Let's say the company is showing the value of closing stock on March 31st as two million dollars on april 1st they would show the same value of opening stock as two million dollars okay so they just need to come up with the cost of closing stock and that closing stock we anyway know is going to become the opening stock value too right it's just the day end on march 31st the accounting period closes on april 1st the accounting period starts so there is no gap in between if you have to say so okay now we discussed the closing stock and the opening stock so what else goes into preparing the trading account a company would be making some purchases in the year right so we need to take the cost of the purchases while we make some purchases from the vendors companies sometimes do return the material back to the vendors due to quality issue or whatever reason right and the vendor pays the money back whatever you're returning that is called as a purchase return okay because you purchased it but you're returning it so that is how it is called purchase and purchase return okay and now so what is the total value of a purchase you have to remove the amount that you received for the purchases return from the amount you paid earlier that gives you the net purchase value okay similar to purchases we need to consider the sales figures as a company they make sales throughout the year they get money from the sales but the company also gets some of its products returned, right? Like we have returned some of the products to our vendor. Some of our customers may also return some of the products that are not fit for the purpose for reasons like quality standards or whatever reason it could be, right? So what we do is we give them the cash back for the returns that they have made, correct? So if we have to come to a net sales value, what we have to do is we have to take the total sales minus the returns we have made because we have to return the money to the customer right we need to deduct that money so far we've considered the closing stock we've considered the opening stock we've considered the net purchase we've considered the net sales right so we also need to consider the direct costs associated with the purchase of goods or the sales of goods remember we only need to consider the direct costs related to the purchase manufacturing or sales of goods not any of the indirect costs like advertisement costs or some back office administration costs only the ones that are directly associated with the production and selling of the goods so like we have direct costs we would also be having direct revenues you might get confused what is the direct revenue and what is the sales what is the difference between them well sales is the sales of the product but direct revenue here is associated with the sales of the product let us say a company sells a product but it will charge to fix that particular product, right? It is a service charge that the company is charging its customers. This is an extra revenue coming directly, which is linked to the sales of the goods. So we need to take into consideration the revenue that we are getting directly from the sales, just not the sales, net sales, but also the revenue that is linked to the sales, okay? We could have mentioned other revenue, but other revenue which is not associated with core operations is not called direct revenue. That's the reason we are saying direct revenue here. Okay. So once we take all these into consideration, how do we do the calculation? So what is the formula? Well, the formula is simple. You need to sum up the net sales and the direct revenue and the opening stock 
and then you need to remove the net purchases cost of goods sold and the closing stock and that will give you the gross profit okay net sales plus direct revenue plus opening stock minus net purchases minus cost of goods sold minus closing stock and it will give us the value of the gross profit right so if you observe carefully trading account is helping the manufacturing firms to come up with the gross profit for the product itself that is being manufactured so the management of the manufacturing industries are extremely interested in this because they know how the product in itself is doing whether the product is profitable or not or if they want to increase the profits what do they have to do things like that okay so this completes the trading account now let's get into the financial statements okay if you have understood all the concepts explained from the beginning till this point trust me financial statements is just a cakewalk for you it is very easy to comprehend if you have stayed so far if you have understood the concepts that i have been explaining so far so what is the purpose of the financial statements the purpose is to provide information about the financial performance of the company all the registered companies are required to produce financial statements and they get audited by government agencies as and when needed any long term investor planning to invest in the stocks of the company will look into the financial statements and with the help of financial statements he will make an informed decision about his or her investment there are many financial statements okay but primarily the important ones are as below profit and loss account which is also known as income statement balance sheet cash flow statements so let's start with profit and loss account profit and loss account is also referred to as pnl account so let's see what is a profit and loss account okay it is there in the name itself we prepare the profit and loss account to know the net profit of the company or the net loss of the company please note the trading or the manufacturing firms will prepare the trading account and profit and loss account together within one account itself and they just call this as trading and pnl account okay so but for the firms that do not prepare the trading account they are not manufacturing firms they would only work on the profit and loss account so there are two reasons to prepare a pnl statement okay one reason is it tells whether the organization is making money and it is a valuable tool to monitor operations companies usually prepare a quarterly pnl account apart from the ones which they usually make at the end of the accounting period right the profit and loss statements also allows outsiders to evaluate the firm's ability to generate profits and manage its resources so pnl statement is a very important statement it is also referred to as popularly income statement and sometimes in some places this is also referred to as statement of operations income statement is a multiple formatted statement which is nothing but coming up with various subtotals or sub amounts of income leading to net income or net losses what i mean by multiple formatted statement is if you see on the screen we have revenues column under that we have sales and sales returns and interest received and the totals and again underneath expenses and the details and the totals so when i say multi formatted it is a whole table divided into multiple formats and their subtotals this is just a small sample for easy understanding of the concept but when it comes to big companies usually the pnl statements may be a page long statement okay so let me show you how to calculate the profit and loss account okay in fact we already have looked into it in the elements of accounting section where we discuss about process to derive net income but let's touch base it again if you take the net sales revenue and deduct the costs of goods sold we get gross profit and then we add other income minus other expenses minus operating expenses to gross profit and we get something called ebitda so this is the formula so gross profit minus operating expenses plus other income minus other expenses okay you get ebitda which is earnings before interest taxes depreciation and amortization okay now if we remove depreciation and amortization we get something called ebit 
and if we remove interest and taxes from EBIT, we get net income. This is our profit and loss account. So what happens is when you get your net income for the current year, company itself would divide the profit by the number of shares the company has and it will tell what is the earning per share. By the way, some of the investors will look out for earnings per share. Okay. You want to know how much equity income the company is generating in the form of net income. So they use this trick called EPS earnings per share just to know that how the company is performing. All right. So now let's look at what is balance sheet. In simple terms, if you remember from the conversation under elements of accounting while discussing the assets, we discussed about the equation between assets, liabilities and equity. So the equation is assets is equal to liabilities plus equity. What balance sheet shows is the total of assets value and the total of liabilities value and the totals of shareholder equity value and it then shows the value that has been derived for the assets is equal to the value of liabilities and the value of equity. Now, if someone asks us what a balance sheet is, we can simply say a balance sheet shows the financial position of the company. It tells us what is the value of the assets of a firm and what are the liabilities of the firm and what is the shareholders equity of the firm. Now, let's see an example how the balance sheet looks like. I have drawn a sample balance sheet that you can see on the screen. In this picture, we see that the details of all the assets are given. Likewise, we have the details of all the liabilities and also the shareholders equity. Okay, you may see the word called capital stock. Capital stock is nothing but the shares of owners that have been issued by the company. Okay, now retained earnings as we have discussed earlier in the elements of accounting is the dividends that were not distributed to the shareholders in the previous years okay in the past years so in this table the assets have matched with the liabilities and the shareholders equity and we are good that is all about balance sheet now let's look at the other financial statement which is statement of cash flow statement of cash flow is nothing but knowing where the cash has come from for the company and where and how it was spent by the company let's be clear we have profits. Profits is not cash. What we're not talking about profits here. We're talking about just the cash. How much of a cash that the company has gotten and where was it spent and how was it spent. Income statement, which is a profit and loss account, does not clearly tell us how much cash have we received and how much cash was spent and how it was spent. But it only tells us how much income we generated. Okay. Think like this profit and loss account tells us about the income generated and the cash flow statement tells about the liquidity position of the firm, the liquidity generating capacity of the firm. Why is it important to generate this cash flow statement? The cash flow statements provide a glimpse as to how well a company generates cash to fund its operating expenses and it also gives a clear indication to the stakeholders about the liquidity position of the firm. The more the liquidity, the more confidence in the firm. So what do we do is in the cash flow statement, we list out all the details of the cash, where the cash has come from and where the cash has gone to. Okay. Cash flow statements are usually broadly summarized into three categories. Okay. Cash flow from operational activities, cash flow relating to investing activities and cash flows relating to financial activities. Cash flow from operational activities includes revenues and operating expenses only for which company received the cash flow. Sometimes the sales are done on the basis of credit. We will not include the sales which are done on the basis of credit. Similarly, if the company has made any purchases on the basis of credit, it will not be considered. Only those things on which the sales are done on cash purchases are done in cash we take that into consideration okay now let's look at cash flows relating to investing activities like purchasing properties plants equipments it should also include any property plant equipment that was sold for cash okay or bought for cash all right 
and finally we have cash flows relating to financing activities these activities include all the activities except for operating activities and investing activities if i have to give an example activities like buying the shares of the company back or paying dividends to shareholders or issuing new shares for money and also taking debt or repaying debt these are some of the activities that fall under the category of financing activities so once you categorize them separately you would take the net cash from operating activities you would take the net cash from investing activities and you take the net cash from financing activities and sum them up and then you would finally get the net cash movement for the accounting period if it is not clear do not worry let me explain it here so if you look at the screen the cash flow statement was categorized into three statements and all the related transactions are mentioned under their respective categories then we calculated the net cash flow statement for each category and at the end of the screen we added all the net cash flow statements usually companies give a comparison of the net cash flow statements for year on year basis to see how a company is doing in terms of its cash position and one thing you can observe carefully is the ending cash flow for each year is becoming the beginning cash flow for next year this is about the cash flow statement hope this is clear if we quickly recap the accounting process section we've gone through a lot of subject here okay from basics to advanced we started identifying the transactions and we've learned about journals what they meant and how to record entries in the journal books and we also looked at the rules to record entries in the journals then we looked at the ledger account in which we understood what a ledger account is with few examples and then we looked at how to do a trial balance to match the totals of credits with totals of debits and then we also looked at the trading account concepts and details and then we moved on to the three financial statements which are income statement balance sheet and cash flow statement we discussed about their importance and how to generate the statements and the examples of them so this completes our accounting basics tutorial now this is the overview of what we've learned so far if you made this far i want to thank you for your support and i hope you learned something important which is going to be very valuable for you from the accounting's perspective as well as if you want to read a financial statement of the company you should be able to read it now and understand what they are capturing there and why they are capturing there and a small note before you leave it took about 3 months of effort to make this video if you like this video please give me a like please do subscribe and i do have very few subscribers and it would be a privilege to have you as one of my subscribers if you could share this video with your friends and peers it would help them to learn the subject as well as it would help this video show up in the first page of searches and wish you all the very best for your future god bless bye